Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Dan Howe. By definition, a public library is a library that is accessible by the general public and is generally funded from public sources. It's operated by librarians and library professionals. In West Virginia, we have 172 of these public institutions. But the state has other types of libraries as well, libraries with varying goals and missions. Those include 33 academic libraries housed in the state's colleges and universities. Academic libraries are attached to institutions of higher learning with two primary goals, to support the school's curriculum and to support research efforts by faculty and students. There's a great deal of variation among academic libraries based on their size, resources, collections, and services. The state's largest academic library is on the campus of West Virginia University. Marshall University has West Virginia's second largest academic library. Other large campus libraries include those at West Liberty University, the University of Charleston, West Virginia State, Shepherd University, Fairmont State, and Concord University. In today's program, we'll take a closer look at academic libraries, how they operate, and how their specific mission takes a different path than that of public libraries. Marshall University's John Deaver Drinko Library opened in 1998 and is a splendid example of a modern, state-of-the-art academic library. The facility offers a full range of traditional library services with a 24-hour computer lab, advanced technical education facilities that include multimedia training and presentation rooms, workstations, and a wide variety of media and internet accessible electronic materials. Dr. Monica Brooks is Marshall's Associate Vice President for Libraries and Online Learning, and I had the chance to visit with her at Marshall's Drinko Library. Dr. Brooks, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Well, can you explain your role uh, on campus for us? Sure. I'm the Associate Vice President for the Libraries and Online Learning Programs here at Marshall University. And my role really is to uh, manage the libraries that we have on campus and also oversee the online learning program from the technology and instructional design development aspect. I know I spent a lot of time on this campus as an undergraduate. In the library that I spent my time in, very different from the Drinko Library. It's very different. It, it is really great to be in a profession that's changed so dramatically in the last 20, 30 years. Um, but yes, we still have the old library, which is the Morrow Library. Mm -hmm. And in that library, we house our federal government depository and also our special collections. In this building, the John Deaver Drinko Library, we consider it more of the um, main undergraduate library. We house general collections, and we have our instruction program located here, and also um, our journals, current journals. I think um, Marshall has the second largest academic library in the state. I believe probably WVU is, is number one. Uh -huh. uh, can you describe the operations here, how things work, uh, you know, size of staff, computer labs? How does all this... Uh, how does all that work? Yeah. Uh, well... Uh, Second largest library, still pretty big uh, yeah. library. We have actually four facilities in, in the library system here at Marshall. There's one in South Charleston. Um, there's one that we're affiliated with at the medical school. And then, of course, there are two fairly large facilities right here on this campus. Um, uh, we have uh, about 17 librarians. They are faculty at Marshall, and so they participate in all aspects of faculty governance on campus, which is great because we make wonderful partnerships with our teaching faculty counterparts. And then we have about 40 to 45 staff members and in all of our facilities that help make sure that the libraries are open and the materials are provided to students and, and support all of the activities that go on. When you uh, Normally this show we focus on public libraries. Uh, so one of the things I'd like to be really clear about what are the differences as you see them between a public library and a academic library in terms of mission and what they're trying to accomplish? 
Well, we all share the same mission in regard to our professional code of ethics and the American Library Association Bill of Rights, providing materials to our constituents. But probably the biggest difference when you compare us to a public library is because our mission is to support the curriculum and research activities of the university. We're collecting materials that, that directly support those, that mission and also those programs. So while we do buy some popular materials, um, we just buy a smidge because uh, we know students are often here on the weekends um, who don't go home or we have international students that would like to have international, just reading, fun reading material in their own languages. Um, but we're gonna have a fairly significant collection of engineering materials or nursing materials or materials that support our English literature classes or art and design or other, other areas. Um, not necessarily have the, the public library mission of providing the leisure reading or the consumer health aspect of what they're doing. So it's just, there's some differences in the collection, differences in some of our training as librarians, um, because uh, we might have a more academic slant to how we provide information, because we know that students might be uh, compiling spe specific types of reports or um, research materials like theses or dissertations that, that might have some components to it that are going to be more in our realm than, than might be public libraries. At the same time, there are lots of things that public librarians do that we don't have to do. So when I've talked to some of my pals in the public library system, I'm very grateful that I don't have to do payroll, <laughs> that I don't have to uh, deal with my own liability. Um, you know, considerations for, you know, you know, the legal parameters of operating a facility um, and also dealing with bonds and, and the tax base that helps support your facility. So I have a great deal of respect for my colleagues in the public libraries because they deal with a lot of things that, that an academic library is kind of shielded from being affiliated with the university. What, uh, what do you consider your biggest challenge as an academic librarian? Probably the number one challenge, which you know you can Google it and find <laughs> this very easily, is the budgetary constraints that a higher education is experiencing right now. It's a national problem. It's a West Virginia problem. We are very fortunate at Marshall that our financial team um, have a very keen understanding of the inflation crisis that we deal with in regard to the forced publisher inflation the expense of academic materials and, and the fact that inflation is, is raised on us arbitrarily year after year. So they've helped us meet those needs, uh, which we sincerely appreciate because we're trying to support accreditation needs and curriculum support needs for our colleagues in the classroom. But budget is probably number one. That impacts our materials. It impacts our ability to fill positions. Um, it impacts our ability to provide facilities and services all the hours that we're open. So anytime there's, or there's budget drama at the legislature, we're on pins and needles, <laughs> just like our, our colleagues and other, and other agencies are, because we, we're concerned that we're not going to be able to meet, um, meet our mission that we just talked about. I would love to get a tour of uh, the library. All right, let's do it. Well, Dr. Brooks, why don't you show me around uh, the Drinko Library? Sure thing. It's first floor. This is where mm -hmm. circulation and our research services mm -hmm. are located. Also, the Learning Commons, which is a combination of some of our popular reading mm -hmm. material and also study areas, including some study rooms and an area that is actually open 24 hours, um, several days a week, which mm -hmm. is great. In the back, we have our IT services desk and also the ID office, and um, we have current newspapers and some DVDs so that students can use those if they need them. Okay. Now, this is the first floor. A lot of activity, obviously, here on this yes. floor, but there are three other floors in this library as That's well. That's right. Uh, on the second floor, we have a writing center and mm -hmm. also an instructional design center for online learning. Mm -hmm. There's also a quiet study area, reading room, and that's also a great place for students to get work done. Mm -hmm. Computers throughout the building, including on the third floor, where the bulk of our collection is located. I noticed on the third floor there were a number of study rooms. Well, I guess folks could go in, close the door, do what they need to do. That's right. All of our floors except the fourth floor have study rooms and students can actually log into our webpage and reserve those themselves. What's on the fourth floor? 
The fourth floor is the computing services area, the hub of our telecommunication system and all the computers that are running everything at Marshall. All on the fourth floor. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in a, a very secure location. <laughs> so are students allowed in that general area? It's really not a, a public area, mm -hmm. but um, we do give tours occasionally so they can see what's happening. Okay. So this is the Drinko side of the library, but there's another side to the Marshall University Library System here on campus, and that's the old Morrow Library. I'd love to get a tour of that. All right, let's take a walk. Okay. We're here now with the Morrow Library, the old library on the Marshall campus. So tell me about how you're using this, this old facility. Well, this old facility got a facelift a while back, and now we're fully renovated with beautiful settings for the special collections, the university archives, our Civil War Library, our Chuck Yeager collection, and also several other really important manuscripts and special collections that are pertinent to this region and to the state of West Virginia. We also have the Federal Government Depository, where we house over two million items that are provided to us by the federal government that cover a wide range of subjects and support research in several of our disciplines. This is a great place to study, so we do have um, areas where we have wireless, and we encourage students to use the facility for that purpose as well. The historian in me has to talk a little bit about uh, the Civil War Museum that we're s currently standing in, and also the Chuck Yeager room, which was also very impressive. Yes. Well, we are very fortunate that the, that the family of Chuck Yeager and, and he provided us um, wonderful artifacts, including the nose cone of when he broke the sound barrier and some of his personal papers that will be available at some point in the future. Um, for this collection, we have um, probably uh, one of the renowned collections that uh, concentrate on the history of the Civil War so that students can write theses, uh, contribute to dissertations, and produce other important scholarly works dealing with that important time in our history. And the other thing I, I mentioned briefly is uh, this is an old library of mine, so when I came in here, it's changed completely from what it was uh, uh, 20 years ago. It really has. Um, there have been two major renovations of this space, and while the front of it still kind of looks like it looked in 1926-29, the inside is completely updated. Dr. Brooks, appreciate your time and uh, enjoyed the, uh, the tour of the, both the Drinko Library and the Morrow Library. Great. Thank you so much. We'll be right back after this. Welcome to Understood.org, a free online resource for parents of kids with learning and attention issues with personalized recommendations, tools, and expert advice. For the second half of today's show, we're taking a look back at the devastating floods of June 2016. Those floodwaters destroyed homes, businesses, schools, and libraries. Three libraries received heavy damage. The Clendenin Public Library in Canola County, the Raynell Public Library in Greenbrier County, and the Clay County Public Library in Clay. Also, the access bridge to the Elk Valley Public Branch Library in Canola County was washed away, forcing that library to close its doors. Since then, the Raynell and Clay libraries were able to reopen fairly quickly thanks to great public support. And recently, the Elk Valley Library also reopened for business. However, the Clendenin Public Library remains in a state of limbo. Let's pay a visit to eastern Kanawha County and see how things have changed in the years since floodwaters drastically altered two of that county's library branches. I'm here at the home of the Elk Valley Branch Library in eastern Kanawha County. This library was shut down for over a year by last year's floods, and not one drop of water reached its door. The library closed because floodwaters destroyed the access bridge to this shopping center. After months of legal wrangling, the bridge was finally rebuilt in July of 2017. And now the library, along with dozens of businesses here, is finally able to open its doors once again. Let's go inside and take a look at the newly reopened Elk Valley Branch Library. I'm here with librarian Ellie Tieford. Ellie, thanks for being with us. Thank you. So Ellie, we've been talking a little bit about the whole situation with the library from a year ago. 
Tell us about the day of the flood and what happened here. Well, we were open until 8, which was raining, obviously, all day that day. Um, I wasn't actually here, but my staff was here. And we closed, and they left, and then probably within the next half hour, the, bril- the bridge collapsed. But luckily, all my staff was was already on the other side of the bridge. And uh, so some of your uh, uh, your staff was affected. Did they, they lose homes? I had some that lost their homes, some that lost their vehicles, some that had were not able to get home, but then were, were able to eventually get to their houses. But some were trapped different places. So the water never reached here? No. Mm-mm. But you were closed for a year? Yes, 13 months. So how did you, how did you cope with that? Well, we had a meeting pretty soon after the flood and to try to decide what to do. And uh, Alan decided that we should try to find a property that we could rent temporarily. We thought, you know, maybe a couple months so that we would be able to service this part of the county since Clendenin was completely destroyed. So we didn't have any library service up the Elk area at all. So we found what had been our location in Big Chimney, which was the original Elk Valley Branch Library before we opened this in 2011, so that was vacant. So they talked to the owners, and they did a lease, and then we moved in there. Now, were you able to get back into this library during that period? Well, the only way we could get here was to walk up the temporary road, which we did a lot. (laughs) Because this was a back road. The main road was washed out. And regular traffic really couldn't use that road. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. It wasn't, it's, yeah. it's not a road for vehicles. Right. I mean, some vehicles have used it, but it's just a <clears throat> rough gravel road that I never drove up. I walked up, but I never drove up. <laughs> so once you got here, what kind of things were you doing uh, in the well, closed library? Well, first we had to come up just to check because right. we had no way of knowing whether we had water in the building. So we had to come up and just... They had the facilities um, department came up and just looked through the whole library to make sure, you know, we didn't have any water, there weren't any problems, which there were no problems, and there was, we had electricity. Um, And then after that, we needed to get things because (laughs) we didn't have, so we did bring up some trucks one time and gather a lot of things that we needed to run the other library. We left the collection here, but we took some of our, well, obviously, some of our personal things, some of the office things that we needed, just to, you know, so it was, and then a lot of the children's supplies that, so she could do programs and different things. And we periodically would grab collections of, I think we got DVDs one time, and we got some just different kids' books and things that, holiday books. So we, we did a lot of trucking down with bags <laughs> of stuff and then coming back. And, uh, How did the temporary <laughs> library work out? It worked out really nicely. Because that was the old location, so that helped. Well, it helped because it, you know, we sort of could lay it out in the same way. I mean, it's a lot smaller. It, we didn't have as much stuff, so it was okay. It's, it's not as nice, obviously, as this right. facility. It's older. And it has, and it has some drawbacks. There's just one little restroom and some things like that. But, I mean, it worked out. People were able to come. And we could, of course, like we always do, we could borrow books from all across the system. So if you needed anything, we could get it for them in a couple of days. So it was, it mm-hmm. it was there wasn't the, the, as big of a browsing collection, but besides that, we could we attempted to do as much as we could. We had programs, we we did things. So you're back home. You've yeah. been here about a week, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me about that that first day when you were finally able to reopen the doors. That was a great day. It was a great day. We were we were very excited. We had our big "We Are Open" signs, and we just as soon as we opened, there were people in the door, and they were just everybody just felt great to drive across the bridge <laughs> and come up and actually go inside one of the you know businesses that's up here. And it was it's we actually one of our patrons brought us a cake and it said "Welcome home." Oh, that's great. So that that kind of summed it up for me. I was like, yeah. We're back home. I was going to ask you about the reaction <laughs> of your patrons. It sounded like it was a pretty good reaction. Yeah, they were they were excited. And people, some people had never been here because maybe they moved into the community in the mm-hmm. last year. 
And they're just looking around going, this is nice. Because <laughs> they hadn't, you know, they didn't know that they had, this was up here. How has traffic been uh, in comparison to what it was before? I, I think more patrons just because a lot of people are doing the tour. They're coming up to the mall to see what's up here. And, oh, the library, and we stopped in there. So we're, we're seeing some new people and just a lot of people that want to see, you know, they, they just want to see it because it's back. Well, it sounds like uh, you were pretty excited and, and your staff pretty excited about finally being able to get everything up and running again. Yeah, I just felt like this was such a waste. This is a beautiful facility. It has a lot to offer, and it was just sitting here with nothing wrong with it, you know, for an entire year, and it's just nice to utilize it again. Well, can you give us a tour? Sure. Let's do that. All righty. Well, as you come in the door, the first thing... We have our new section. We've got new books for kids, teens, and adults. And if you curve around this corner, we have our children's area. We have board books for babies all the way through chapter books for older kids. Then this section is all of the fiction for adults. Mm -hmm. We have audiobooks down this aisle. We have large type books, music, and then this center area, computers that mm -hmm. for the public to use. We have over here our lovely staff. Are you going to introduce oh, us? This is Nanette and Penny. They've both been with us for quite a while. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And we have this section. We've got our DVDs. Mm -hmm. And then this, the rest of this area is nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And what's back this way? Back this in the back corner, we have our teen area. And they have a little sitting area and some computers. And then they have books and graphic novels for mm -hmm. teens. And then across the back wall, we have three study rooms. For quiet study that anybody can use just mm -hmm. either for tutoring or studying a few more computers probably mm -hmm. designed are these designed for the, the these teens, are for the teens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well this is a great looking library and uh, glad to see it was not affected by the floods yes we're very happy about that okay. ellie i appreciate your time and uh, thanks for giving us the tour oh you're welcome so one canal county branch library is open the other one still not we'll talk about that after this have a kit so you're ready for any emergency. Develop a plan for what you and your family will do before disaster strikes and stay informed during severe weather any way you can. No library was more affected by last year's devastating flooding than the Clendenin Branch Library. Nothing inside the building was salvageable and the library remains closed more than a year later. With us now to talk about the building and its future, Marketing and Development Manager for Kanawha County Public Libraries, Terry Wood. Terry, thanks for being with us. Thank you, Sam. So, first describe for me the damage to the branch from last year's floods. The branch was, everything inside was completely destroyed. Uh, the floodwaters reached up to 9 to 10 feet in, inside the building. Um, when we went there after the, the waters receded, um, there were DVDs and books in the ceiling tiles, so everything was completely covered in water and destroyed. What was the reaction that, the, that day when you found out about the damage to the library? It was devastating. Um, I mean, the floods were devastating for everyone. People lost their lives, their homes, their businesses, um, and um, we were upset that uh, we were no longer going to be able to serve the public in Clementa for many, many months. What happened to the employees there? Uh, the employees that worked at the Clinton Ranch were moved to uh, the Elk Valley Express. So no one lost their job? No. That's, that's, no, that's excellent. Yeah. Uh, so give us an update on the status of the Clinton Branch. Um, it's been a long process with the Clinton Branch. Uh, there were many months of um, working with FEMA and our insurance company to uh, assess the damage, the loss, and um, at this time the, there is no plan for, for what's going to happen at Clendenin. and it's not that uh, nothing's going to happen, it's just that we're not at a place where we're able to make a plan yet. we have a timeline of any kind? Not really, no. So what's the reaction to the public then? I know Clendenin loses their library. What has the, what's been the reaction from the town? 
Uh, I think the town misses the library, and we've, we've tried to, in addition to opening the El Valley Express location, we added uh, an extra stop. The bookmobile has been going to Clendenin every Friday afternoon for about four hours every, every week. And uh, we also purchased uh, one of the little, little free library um, structures and placed that on the property where the old branch, where the Clendenin branch is, and uh, have been trying to keep books in there so that people would have access to some books. With the reopening of the Elk Valley branch, that should help quite a bit. Yes, now that we have access to the Crossings Mall, the bridge has been uh, replaced. Um, people can come to the Elk Valley Express Library, which is, is larger. Uh, sorry, people can come to the Elk Valley Branch Library, which is larger than the Elk Valley Express Library. So, what's been the toughest aspect of, of dealing with all this from the uh, KCPL's perspective? Not only Clendenin, but Elk Valley. What, what's been the toughest aspect of that? I think the uncertainty, uh, the many, many months that we were waiting to hear the news about what was going to happen with the bridge, and we just um, had to keep waiting and, and wait for that bridge to be restored before we could get back to it. Can you describe for me the how the library system reacted on that, that first day? I mean, you had to make some quick decisions, some tough decisions early on. Right. Um, we were not able to access the... Uh, the library into well we couldn't get to the crossings mall but we also couldn't get to Clendenin for a couple of days because of the floodwaters we were not allowed uh, in the area so it took a couple of days um, for staff to get to the, those locations and try to assess what the damage was. I would assume you guys learned some some hard lessons from from all of this. Uh, any way to apply some of those lessons to to things that might happen down the road? I think what we, one, the main thing that we learned is how dedicated our staff are, uh, how dedicated the board is, and um, quickly reacted to the situation. I mean, the Elk Valley Express Library was set up in, within a week's time, so we, we responded quickly and made sure that people had access to library services. People still didn't have electricity when the Elk Valley Express Library opened, so they needed computers, they needed to come in and use a copier. And uh, so we were able to provide that. We had you know, a place where they could come to, that was air conditioned, they could get out of that and the heat. Uh, so we were able to quickly uh, take care of that, and we were very pleased that we were able to help people that same. Terry, thanks for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. We'll be back with some closing thoughts after this. The West Virginia Library Commission encourages lifelong learning, individual empowerment, civic engagement, and an enriched quality of life by enhancing library and information services for all West Virginians. For questions or comments regarding topics on this show, please do not hesitate to call us at 1-800-642-9021 or visit us online at www.librarycommission.wv.gov. To keep you updated on library happenings in the state and beyond, the West Virginia Library Commission uses the WVLC website, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube channel, and the Library Lookout newsletter. If you haven't liked us or followed us on social media yet, please do. It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes, and you can do it here. So what are you waiting for? Just go to the site. I'd like to thank my guests on today's show, Ellie Tiford of the Elk Valley Branch Public Library, Terry Wooten with Kanawha County Public Libraries, and Dr. Monica Brooks, who provided us with an in-depth look at academic library facilities, specifically Marshall University's Drinko and Morrow Libraries. I'm your host, Stan Howe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.